You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. Good morning, everybody. I would like to wish you a happy Valentine uh, for both the to everybody, actually, uh, the ladies and to the men. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, it would have been wonderful if we were together uh, to celebrate this, but uh, I just want to let you know that we love you, I love you, and I appreciate that God has brought you all into our lives. Uh, this pandemic is not for nothing. God is doing wonderful things. There have been uh, people that have been uh, coming with us, people who have joined our services, who are listening to us, not just here in California, but also around the United States. And specifically, we have listeners and worshipers in Canada. We have worshipers in the United Kingdom. We have worshipers in Lagos, Nigeria. We have worshipers in Cotonou. We have worshipers in Aklankwa in the Republic of Benin. So we welcome all of you, and we thank you for joining us and being with us. And I wish you and yours happy Valentine's Day today. Um, we are now going to uh, talk about God's righteousness and God's justice. God is a righteous God, and he is a just God. Just, God is righteous and just. And we are taking these two attributes together, and it will probably take us two weeks to finish this. But we're taking these two attributes together because they naturally flow from the attribute of God, which is holiness. Because God is holy, he is righteous and just. So we are basically uh, saying that the logical way to deal with the righteousness and the justice of God is to talk about his holiness first because the righteousness and justice of God flow naturally. They are transitive result of his holiness. So God is holy and God is righteous and God is just. God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, God is transcendent, God is imminent, God is holy, and God is right and just. God is righteous and just. So let me look at some passages. I'm going to quote some passages. We're going to look at some passages together that form the basis of our understanding of the righteousness and justice of God. So it is important for us to look at this. Let's look at Genesis uh, chapter 18 and verse 25. Genesis chapter 18 and verse uh, 25. In the New International Version, it said, Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? So let's. We're going to come back to that. But that is the basic premise of the entire Old Testament message about the righteousness 
and justice of God. That God is holy, and because he is holy, he is righteous, and he is just. And therefore, he cannot treat the wicked and the righteous in the same way. It is totally against his nature. Totally against his nature. He does not judge the wicked and the righteous the same way. Because he is a righteous God, and because he is righteous, he is just. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. I'm not going to be telling you the translation I'm using. Most of you should assume right away that I am using the New International Version translation. Those of you that have other translations, it may sound a little bit different and it may be confusing, but I hope it is not confusing to you. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Right there, you can see it. That uh, G- God is the rock. Jesus is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. He is upright and he is just. Okay, we're just reading the passage right now. I will deal with it a little bit as we move. Let's look at Psalm 7, verses 9 through 12. Psalm 7, verses 9 through 12. Bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. You, the righteous God, who probes minds and hearts, my shield is God most high, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his his, his wrath every day. If he does not relent, he will sharpen his sword, he will bend and string his bow. So God is a righteous God. God is a just God. God is a holy God. And I know that God has been accused in our modern world of not being just because of some of the things that are happening. But let us look deeply into the message of the Bible. Both the Old and the New Testament makes it very clear. Now, I want to correct something before we go deeper into these uh, attributes of God. It is important for us to correct today the saying that is very common among many Christians and even among non-Christians. And the saying simply is, God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. That is actually a nonsensical statement. Just think about it for a minute. But before we go deeper into it, let me read to you what God himself said in his word. Psalm 18, verses 24 through 26. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But, if you were to stop there, some of the statements we made may be correct, may be arguable, may be acceptable and all that, but it did not stop there. It said, but to the devious, 
you show yourself shrewd. And the only way we can truly understand the message there is to go way before and read uh, Psalm 5 and verse 5. Psalm 5 and verse 5. And then I'm going to suggest that we even read it a lot deeper. But let me concentrate on just verse 5 for now. In Psalm 5 and verse 5, the psalmist says, The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. I just want that to sink in for a minute. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. Now, listen. This passage does not say, the arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all the deeds of the wicked. Or you hate all the deeds of those who do wrong. You, you see, you cannot separate what you did from yourself. You cannot separate the evil that you perpetrate from who you are. There is no way you can say, just punish the sin and leave the sinner alone. By definition, sin is transgression. Against God. Sin is doing the things that God does not want. God is a holy God and therefore his law is holy. We're going to deal with that later on. So to transgress what God has done, you cannot remove yourself from it. As if sin is something that is just going around and committing sin. Sin does not commit sin. Sin happens because Men commit sin. The Bible is very clear. God hates evil and he hates the doers of evils too. Now, let's read it, let's read it in, in, in context and read Psalm 5, verses 5 through 8. Please listen very carefully because I know some of you, this may be the first time you're hearing this. Some of you, you may have heard it before. Some of you may believe in what I'm saying. Some of you may be right now fighting what I'm saying. But guess what? I'm standing on the word of God. I am just preaching the word of God. Listen to it. Psalm 5, verses 5 through 8. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy Lies. No, that's not what it says. It didn't say you destroy lies. It said you destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful. You, Lord, you detest them. But I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, Lord in your righteousness because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. We can do it. The righteous God is in judgment over evil and those who do evil. Evil cannot exist without doers of evil. Sin came into the world through man. You cannot separate yourself from the evil that you do and just say God loves you. He just hates what you're doing. This is very common in Christianity. People say it with pride. God loves sinner, but he hates the sin. He hates both. And that is why I cannot separate myself from what I am doing. What I am doing cannot happen without me. And the reason why it happens 
when it is evil, when it is sin, is because I have missed the mark of God. What is sin? S I N. What is sin? A lot of us define sin in such a way that we really truly don't understand what we're doing because sin is willful disobedience against the law of God and the will of God and the wishes of God. Sin is as if God placed a target in front of you, like we do when we play dart. You know, you will shoot against that target in front of you. Sin, this is what sin is. God put a target in front of us, and instead of shooting that target, we ignore God's target and we turn around and start shooting against something else. You will never meet the standard of God if you are not aiming at the standard of God. The reason why there is evil in the world is because everyone con- uh, ignores the holiness, the righteousness, and the justice of God. And the reason why I believe we don't understand it fully is we try to compare Compartmentalize God. God is love here. God is justice here. God is righteous here. God is omnipresent here. God is omniscient here. God is merciful here. God is this. No, God is everything at the same time. Do not dissect God. Don't compartmentalize God. God is all his attributes at the same time. Now let's look at the etymology of the word. Let's look at the story, the the line of the word, the, the beginning of the word, how the word came to be used. If you're looking at it in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, basically it means to be right. Some of the Old Testament words were translated as straight, not crooked. It's straight, straight point. The shortest distance between two points, straight. Amen. Uh, You know, I used to jokingly tell people, uh, don't beat around the bush around me because I'm from Africa. I know very well how to beat around the bush. It's because when people want to tell lies, they give you a verbose explanation of what has happened. Have you ever seen, you know, uh, I remember when my children were growing up, when they have done something wrong and you ask them to tell you why, you better be ready for a long story. And you're going to see end, 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 end. Therefore, And, 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 and. When we are trying to tell lies, we are going around, beating around the bush, not being straight. The meaning of the word righteous, the etymology of the word starts from that. Right, straight, to the point. Amen. That's why Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Get to the point. God is to the point. God is holy. God is righteous. He doesn't have to go around explaining and explaining and explaining. The word is sometimes also used to mean upright. Not leaning to the side. And sometimes we lean to the side because we are blown by every wind and everything that's coming around. When you're with uh, these people, you believe in what they say. Then when you go here, you believe in what they're saying. You go here, you believe in what they're saying. 
And that makes you unstable. You're not upright. This word righteousness or righteous or right is a very important word. In fact, it is used more than 530 times in the Bible. And then when you add the word right and just to it, that one also is used more than 215 times in the Bible. When you consider all these words, you see that righteousness, justice, I'm not even using the word judgment right now because that's part of it that is related to it. Some of the most common favorite words in the Bible. God is a righteous God. God is a just God. God is a right God. He is upright. And because he is holy, his righteousness cannot be compared with anything. In fact, if you want to talk about right and wrong, you have to start with God. That's how we know right from wrong. Now, I want to focus on righteousness before we end this message today, and we'll go next time into the just and the justice of God, that God is a just God, and he is a God that does not spare judgment. Let us look at some passages. Ezra chapter 9. Verse 15, we're talking about the nature of God, that God is a righteous God. In Ezra chapter 9, verse 15, Ezra, the Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. It's an exclamation mark. You need to say it with all the gusto that is in you. He said, we are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt. Though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. When you stand before God, you see his holiness. That's what the angels saw. That's what the seraphs saw. That's what the apostles saw. That's what the early uh, Christians saw. And they profess the righteousness of God. That God is right. And God is righteous. Let's look at Psalm 7 and verse 9. Bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. You, the righteous God, who probes minds and hearts. This is the God we serve. He is the righteous God who probes minds and hearts. And when you ask for anything in his presence, you plead on his holiness, his righteousness, his justice. In Psalm 50 and verse 6, the psalmist said, And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, that he is right. And the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Uh, let's look at the psalmist again in Psalm 71, verses 15 through 19. He said, my mouth will tell your righteous deeds of your saving acts all day long. Though I know not how to relate them all. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds, even when I am old and gray. Do not forsake me, my God, till I declare the power of the next generation. Till I declare your power 
to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, who is like you, God? Who is like you? Who is righteous like you? No one. Because righteousness is defined by you. In Psalm 97 verse 2, the psalmist also said, clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. The foundation of the throne of God. The foundation of the relationship to God. The foundation of the relationship of God to his creation. The foundation of the relationship of God even to nature. It is his righteousness. God is righteous and God is just. And then the longest chapter in the Bible, you are all familiar with it, is found in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And Psalm 119 focuses on the word of God. And I want to tell you, if you want to be righteous, in your dealings with men, in your dealings with your family, in your dealings with your wife, in your dealings with your husband, in your dealings at school, it doesn't matter where you are. If you want to be righteous, you must be familiar with the righteous commands of God. And how can you be familiar with the righteous commands of God if you are not in the word of God? Read Psalm 119 from the beginning to the end. But today, I just want to focus on the fact that the word of God talks in Psalm 119 about his righteousness and what it can do. It's righteousness that is related to his command. It's righteousness that is related to his word. It's righteousness that is related to his will. It's righteousness that is related to his command. Psalm 119, verse 40, how I long for your precepts in your righteousness, preserve my life. Notice he talked about longing, desiring the precepts of God, the word of God. In it, you will preserve my righteousness. For you see, as you're familiar with the word, the word cleanses you because the word comes to you. It will not go away without accomplishing that which God has sent it for. Psalm 119 verse 137. You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. Again, it's talking about the word of God. Psalm 119 verse 142. Your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. He's tying the two together. He's building it. He's building it little by little. Like if you see Shola's plays that he has written, at the beginning, you're wondering what this is going to be. He begins to build it up. Sin one goes to sin two, go to sin three, go to sin four. And by the time you know it, you are crying. You're wiping your tears away because you're getting the message. The psalmist is beginning to build it up. Psalm 119, he talks about it. He builds it up. He builds it up. In verse 142, he said, your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. In Psalm 144, he says, your statutes are always righteous. Give me understanding that I may live. In verse 172, he said, my tongue sing of your word for all your commands are righteous. I wish I had time to go deeper into it. It picks it up in Psalm 145. Psalm 145 verse 7, he said, they celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. Hallelujah. Are you still with me? 
We're looking at the righteousness of God. Now, let's go to the prophet Jeremiah. Prophet Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 24, says the following. But let the one who boasts, boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in this I delight, declares the Lord. If you want to love what God loves, you love justice, you love righteousness, you love kindness. I am the Lord. I delight in these things. That's our God. In Daniel, I want this the last I'll deal with in the Old Testament, then I'll jump quickly to a few verses in the New Testament. Daniel chapter 9, verse 7. And Daniel chapter 9, verse 14, we read the following. Lord, you are righteous. But this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. The Lord is righteous. Amen. When you understand that God is righteous, you never ask the question, why me? You're dealing with a righteous God. He does nothing wrong. He does nothing evil. Because he is righteous. I want to draw your attention to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, which is one of the most memorized scriptures in the Bible. I think we all know it. Uh, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount was talking about fasting and treasures in heaven and how we should not worry and how we should give to the needy. He touched on one of some of the most important passages in that chapter 6. He talks about fasting and praying, how that is important to us as believers, what we need to do to get some things done in our lives. But it all focuses on one thing, which is found in chapter 6, verse 33. And you really have to focus on this. Jesus said in there, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek God's righteousness. Don't, don't try to be righteous like the world. Don't do that. No. Seek God's righteousness. He said, his righteousness. God's righteousness. God's righteousness stems intrinsically from his holiness. God's righteousness. The only one that is truly right. And that is why in John chapter 17, verse 25, Jesus calls God the Father, righteous Father. Righteous Father. Let us look at 2 Peter, 2 Peter, I'm going to read uh, in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 1, just one verse, just one verse. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Hold that thought right there. Hold it in your mind before I laid the bomb on you. It just opened my mind when I realized 
what God has done for us. He laid, he laid this on me. It, it opened my eyes. It blew me away. Listen to what Peter is telling the Christians that are scattered all over. So to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen? You can have grace. You can have peace. You can have that unless you have the abundance knowledge of God that has been brought to us through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Before I read on the final one, I want to look at one passage in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 5. I hope you're not confused here. Revelation 16 and verse 5. I'm going somewhere. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in this judgment. You who are and who were the Holy One because you have so judged. God who has judged. This is the essence of the gospel. Now, let me bring it back home. And let us look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. When we look at Romans chapter 1, we see in here the cross of the gospel that we preach. The cross of the gospel, the center of the gospel, the inner being of the gospel. This is what we are preaching, and it is built on something. Listen carefully. I'm, I'm getting ready to close. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, look at verses 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is the center of the gospel. This is what we preach. This is what we teach. This is what we believe. I am not ashamed of it. I may be ashamed of a lot of things in my life. I'm not ashamed of that. I may be ashamed that one time I was expelled from high school at Baptist Boys High School. I may be ashamed of that. I may be ashamed of the time that I consider myself a rebel. I'm ashamed of that. I am ashamed of a lot of things in my life. But there's one thing that I am not ashamed of. I am not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God and that power is based on the righteousness of God. It is because of the righteousness of God that we have a gospel at all. God cannot look on sin. God does not wink on sin. God does not wink on our sin situation. It does not relate to his holiness. It does not relate to his righteousness. It does not relate to his justice. So he gave himself up. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at the great hymn of the Christian church in Philippians said, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who though being equal with God, did not count equality something to hold on to, but he humbled himself and died even the death on the cross. That is why God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Why? Because the righteousness of God is glorified in the death of Jesus Christ. And in the death of Jesus Christ, death died. So that you may have life. Why will you then leave righteousness out? Righteousness exalted a nation 
But sin is a reproach to God's people. That is the center of the cross. That is the center of the gospel. The gospel is based on the righteousness of God. And that righteousness is imputed on us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving us what we don't have. That is why theologians consider it a forensic terminology. God just declared us righteous. You're righteous because you are now related to a righteous God. You're righteous because you are now related to a righteous Lord. You're righteous because you are now related to a righteous paraclete. You are righteous. You are now in the presence of God. And when I look at you, I see the righteousness of Jesus. When I look at you, I see the complete work of the paraclete. When I look at you, I satisfy my own righteousness because I am holy. Thank you. God bless. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.